This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm excited to introduce you to Jennifer Cody Epstein. Jennifer is the internationally best-selling author of The Painter from Shanghai, Wonderland, and The Gods of Heavenly Punishment, which won the Asian Pacific American Honor Award for Literature for Adult Fiction. She has written for The Wall Street Journal, Vogue, Self, Mademoiselle, and others. And she joins me today on Uncorking a Story to discuss her career and her latest novel, The Mad Woman of Paris. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, happy to have you here, Jennifer. And I'm curious, where does your story as an author begin? Um, I would say it actually probably begins around the time that I learned how to read. I mean, I think it goes back that far once I started really understanding what reading was and what books were and um, very quickly realized that books were going to become very central to my life, which they did pretty much from the minute I could read. I was just always walking around with one and I, I knew that I wanted to write them. So I would say it goes back many decades. <laughs> Uh, it didn't actually become um, sort of a reality until sort of in my late 30s, early 40s. I'd been a, um, sort of trying to use my interest in writing and reading as a journalist, sort of working for different um, journalistic entities, mostly overseas. And while I really enjoyed that, and I'm realizing in retrospect, it really gave me a, a ton of um, wonderful material to begin kind of thinking through as I started writing fiction. Um, I didn't actually start writing fiction in earnest until about 2000, which is when I sort of did pivot and went to get my MFA at Columbia. Um, and that was kind of when I really was putting on the training wheels and uh, trying to figure out if I actually could do this for some kind of a living or not. Um, and got so much encouragement and support there and, and great feedback on my stuff. And I took the leap and wrote my first novel. So, um, yeah, long process. <laughs> well, just going back to, you know, when you when you started reading, you kind of knew that, hey, maybe you'd eventually want to be a writer. Do you remember any of your early stories, any of that early work? Um, I know that in sixth grade, I completed probably my very first sort of somewhat fleshed out short story. It was picked by Mr. Kahane, my um, my teacher at the time as the sort of story of and I got to be in the author's corner in our sixth grade in classroom, <laughs> which for me was, um, you know, it felt like a real sign that I, you know, this was probably what I should be trying to do. So, um, you know, I think that that was my very early work, earliest, earliest work. And then when I started things, I think I wrote a couple short stories uh -huh. as I was a journalist, thinking that I would be able to, you know, fiction was something I'd be able to kind of cram into the margins of my professional life. Um, and very quickly realized, as I think many novelists do, that just wasn't wasn't going to work. I, I needed to really give it my full attention. Uh, and once I did that, I, I started producing more short stories at Columbia and, um, you know, exploring both personal things and um, sort of trying to kind of unpack some of the interests that I'd formed um, working mainly in Asia um, in my years with the Wall Street Journal and NBC. Um, so that was that was sort of very much uh, sort of the early work that I did. And from there, I, I branched out into more recent uh, and sort of European history in the last two novels. Did did you ever send any of your work to Mr. Cohane? I You know, I didn't. <laughs> I unfortunately lost touch with him, but uh, that's a good it's a good reminder that um, it would be nice to probably reach out to him. I have been in touch with other like my my um, high school AP English teacher who was also super supportive of my writing and I have been in touch with with her Jeannie Goddard so um but I probably should reach out to Mr. Kahane as well <laughs> just you know you put the early wind in your sails so I figured hey. that's actually true that's a really good point so well thank I, you <laughs> I, I do want to talk a little bit about the importance of encouragement before we we talk about of course your latest book um because you mentioned of course you know Mr. Kahane sixth grade writer's corner uh 
that that you know giving you a little bit of a sense of hey you know maybe I could do this someday and then jumping you, know, you gave me a little little bit about you know getting your MFA from Columbia and that's where you you built up a little confidence as well how important is getting encouragement for authors I think it's essential I mean I, I think writing as I'm sure you you recognize as well is is uh, riddled with self doubt as an exercise uh, you do so much of it on your own, sort of out of your own head, uh, which can be an amazing and marvelous place for, you know, finding stories and imagination. But when it comes to, um, you know, confidence in your writing, I think it's really easy to lose if you don't have a full, um, you know, you're working, giving you help, feedback and honest feedback, um, but also telling you that, you know, if you can do it, you can do it and just get going. I mean, I think that Columbia was absolutely essential for me in that way. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a lot of debate about the um, general value of MFA programs. Uh, for me, I, I feel like it was it was absolutely crucial to sort of being able to make that turn from sort of journalistic writing to fiction, which was what I knew that I'd, I'd always wanted to do. Um, and then even after Columbia, I always have a, a small group of, of getting sort of colleagues who I reach out to, who I exchange work with, um, deadlines with. And I think that communal aspect of it is is really a part of what keeps me doing it to the extent that I do. You talked about self-doubt earlier. I'll just share that I, I took a bath in self-doubt this morning. Oh, sure. It's just... <laughs> That's that. I'm sure it was a lovely, lovely marinade. <laughs> that was gr- no, it was great. Uh, we, all, the wa- we all do it. The the water was nice and cold. Um, yeah, so fantastic. <laughs> Probably kind of murky. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, having, yeah. having this this group of people that you surround yourself with, you know, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there that you know writing is a very solitary process, and of course it is, and it can be. But there is a collaborative aspect to it as well. Have have you found that as well? I, I I actually I really have, and I feel like that collaborative aspect is a huge part of what, um, you know, what keeps me writing and what makes my writing, you know, as good as it really possibly can be. You know, um, I collaborate as I said, I have a couple, you know, close writing friends that I collaborate with. Him was exchanging stuff with my husband as a storyteller. Um, as well, he's a filmmaker, so he's a different kind of writer, but he's exceptionally good at plot, which is great because that's not something that I'm always great at. I'm such more of a wordsmith. I really love the art of kind of honing sentences and slowing words and finding alliteration. And, um, and it's easy when you do that to kind of lose sight of the larger understructure of the story. So, you know, I think that there's people that provide different pieces of, um, you know, the recipe for you. And, um, I don't, I, I very much doubt that, that there's anybody with very few exceptions who can just sit down and, and do it completely on their own. Um, I think if they do that, you know, the, the, res- there be, um, you know, you, you can lose your way very quickly and get discouraged, you know, and, or you can end up writing something that you think is either really great and may not be as great as you think it is. And you really needed that feedback along the way to kind of keep you, keep you on and real about it. Or something that is terrible and you don't want the world to see, which might actually be fabulous. So, yeah, I just I think the the community, that was actually one of the biggest surprises for me when I went to fiction, because I also had sort of thought, oh, I'm sitting in a little room with a view and and do my writing. And um, it's a much, much more communal um, process than that. Yeah, I've also found people in the writing community, they're just so generous with their time. Um, you know, e- even people who, you know, you might be, you know, quote unquote competitors with will, will spend some time to, to talk to you and mentor you. And, and you may have done this, you know, for, for other aspiring authors as well. I mean, there's just a, like, a, I think it's just a lot of generosity in the writing community, which is, it's a beautiful thing to see and experience. It, it is. And I think a big part of that is that to be a writer, I think you really need to have empathy. Um, you know, I think part of, for me, the writing process is getting into characters, understanding different perspectives, and um, and really kind of um, you know inhabiting them. And I think as writers, we all have to hone that skill. And so I think it's sort of natural that we would then turn the empathy towards each other. Just in, in and it's also just so hard, you know. I mean, everybody who does it recognizes that it is it is um, deceptively 
tricky and difficult and and sometimes debilitating. And that, you know, if we don't help each other out, then I mean, I think a lot of people just would drop by the wayside and stop doing it altogether. So um I, I agree. People are always unexpectedly helpful and and um, you know, warm and supportive. And it's a wonderful thing. And but I also can understand why why that is, because we all need that support. Yeah. And I, I love what you had to say about empathy. Because, you know, you are inhabiting these characters and, and oftentimes they are people who are not very much like us. So how do you put yourself in their shoes and make them really three dimensional and make them people that, you know, you either care about or on the other side that, you know, you, you might you might hate because um, those those are important to write, too. So empathy, I think empathy and curiosity are, are two big superpowers that that writers hold. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. And I think, you know, the empathy works on both ends of the the character spectrum. I mean, the characters that obviously you relate to, it's very helpful in kind of holding them out. But even the characters that you that you don't, you know, you you find those sort of um, intersections. I mean, every there is a, a commonality to the human experience, no matter how different, you know, our lives are. And I think can you can really flesh out and add dimension to characters by just grasping onto those those moments and those kinds of um, sort of stepping stones, you know, is the way I think about it. Uh, you know, so I, I know that I feel this way in these situations. So even if I don't like this character and they're not me, chances are that it would be plausible that they would feel this way too. And you put that in and that adds a, a dash of authenticity and then you go looking for the next piece. So. Well, speaking of stepping stones, let's step into the Mad Woman of Paris. What, are, what can you share with us about the Mad Woman of Paris? Um, the Mad Women of Paris is um, a novel set uh, in France in the 19th century, um, and it's actually set at the Salpêtrière, which is the it, it is now a very big um, and very well regarded teaching hospital in Paris. Uh, about 150 years ago or so, which is when I was writing, it was the France probably Europe's largest women's asylum, and they had a, a huge hysteria ward. Um, because hysteria was sort of the epidemic of, of the day, according to many experts and pundits. And um, what I discovered when I sort of stumbled into this, I, I actually found a photograph that had been taken with one of the patients from the hysteria ward that was very bizarre and intriguing. Um, and I learned that um, there was just this whole um, almost industry that had been built around women, you know, in the hysteria ward, you know, certain women in particular who um, seem to exhibit intriguing or um, sort of uh, helpful in terms of sort of medical science symptoms of, of this mysterious disease was. And the doctor is led by um, a very famous doctor named Jean-Martin Charcot, who is considered by many to be the founding father of neurology, uh, would study them and um, put them on stage to discuss their illness uh, in front of very eager and interested, interested audiences. Uh, and the part that really pulled me in uh, was that Charcot was um, an advocate of using hypnosis as a clinical tool. So he decided that if he could hypnotize hysterics, and he believed that only hysterics could be hypnotized, he thought that if you could be hypnotized, that was a sure sign that you were hysteric, uh, you could get otherwise very chaotic and difficult to kind of comprehend symptoms uh, to manifest in a much more orderly, controllable way. So he would hypnotize these oftentimes very young, poor women on stage and put them through their sort of hysterical steps in front of these audiences. And I just found that scene um, beguiling and horrifying and fascinating. And um, as is always the case with my historical fiction, it was a moment I realized I really wanted to dive into. So that became The Mad Women of Paris. I remember studying Charcot as an undergraduate in psychology. That was that was my major. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated. Well, I was fascinated by the psychoanalysts. And Freud had his own cures, um, suspected cures for hysteria as well. But mm -hmm. uh, I remember him and and being like a, almost like a, a, a godfather of using um, hypnosis in terms of treatment. But I, I didn't. I guess I didn't fully remember or grasp, you know, the the, the exploitation that he was, um, yeah, you know, kind of uh, having people go through, um, which yeah, sounds, yeah. sounds horrifying. Yeah, I mean that was the thing. I, I I'd read about it, you know, in numerous papers, um, but there was very little 
you know, focus on, I mean, everybody reveres Charcot still, rightly, because he was a genius and he early was, you know, one of the early identifiers of um, in ALS. I mean, he, and he also um, mentored, right? So we probably wouldn't even have modern day psychoanalysis um, had we not had Jean-Martin Charcot because, you know, Freud studied under him for six months, I think, but they were so formative for him. He changed his field of study entirely uh, from clinical practice to uh, you know, what became psychology and psychiatry. Um, but, you know, I, while people sort of would sort of talk somewhat sort of askance and sort of in lowered tones about the hysteria chapter of Charcot's life, I, I really hadn't seen anybody unpack it um, in a way that demanded accountability. And uh, that was what I really decided that this book would be about, was kind of shining this spotlight on this moment in a very famous, um, important man's career that I think a lot of people just wanted to kind of uh, brush under the carpet because it was sort of embarrassing. I mean, he was clearly wrong about most, if not all, of his theories about hysteria. But more importantly, the way that he sort of got to, you know, use the hysteria ward as his personal laboratory and the way that these women were, you know, at once kind of ignored, but also fetishized. Um, and they were already so damaged when they came in. Uh, and there was really no regard for their well-being at all once they did come in. And and that was something that I thought hadn't really been um, discussed in most of the literature that I'd seen. There was there was one nonfiction book uh, that, you know, does a really lovely job of kind of looking at the women in the hysteria ward at the self That's um, Medical Muses um, by um, Asti Hustaved. Uh, but... Uh, other than than her book, which was drawn from transcripts and and other places, you know, I didn't really see anybody talking about the real impact of the way that these women were treated. And I always find that, I mean, it's wonderful to read about things in nonfiction form, but I think that there's a real power um, in exploring them fictively because you really pull both yourself in and pull readers in in an entirely different way. You almost have an experience um, that that exploitation, that environment yourself um, and or themselves, you know, if they happen to be the readers. And so it seemed like a really uh, unique opportunity to sort of take a look at this uh, otherwise much forgotten, overlooked moment in, in, you know, both women's history and medical history. Yeah. And it, it's kind of fascinating to think of um, kind of kind of where we've come since then and just all we know now about how traumatic experiences earlier in life or really at, at any point in life can lead to what you know we would have called hysteria back in you know the 19th century absolutely no I, I think i mean hysteria actually stayed in the dsm until 1980 which was something i thought was astonishing <laughs> you could actually get a hysteria diagnosis you know up until the time i was starting junior high school which is crazy <laughs> to me um but uh, but I think that the diagnosis has since sort of been refined into numerous other more particular diagnoses, um, you know, things like PTSD, conversion disorder, um, you know, borderline personality disorder. Um, but the trauma factor seems to be kind of a through line for, for almost all of them. And it certainly seemed to have been um, a huge part of what was making these women so vulnerable and, um, you know, struggling as much as they did. Um, and, and, you know, what was interesting to me was, you know, then as now in many ways, you know, it was the symptoms that got the attention and not the source of the trauma. Um, that was something that people just didn't have a lot of interest in or time for. Um, right. So again, that was something else. I thought this was an opportunity to try to, to kind of focus on. Yeah. And it, it is somewhat ironic too, because I, I do know that hypnosis can be used as a therapeutic tool to, to help identify past traumas that that we don't necessarily remember in our in our conscious mind but it has to be done in a way that is you know a little bit more um maybe ethical for the patient versus them being on a stage or 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 you know being you know quote unquote entertainment yeah i i think that's absolutely right and and one of the other aspects of this moment you know was that i i saw really no evidence in in any of the reading and the research that i did that there was a lot of interest in actually trying to treat these women. You know, they were specimens. They were um, examples of a disease that very powerful men wanted to identify, you know, in large part to kind of seal their legacies within the medical field. Um, but there wasn't a lot of, of 
interest in whether the women actually got better. The interest was in using them to help articulate what their disease was, you know. So it was really another case of sort of women losing autonomy over their own their own bodies, you know, and their own well-being, um, which, again, is, is a, a kind of common, you know, through line through till today in many levels. You know, I think right. writing this, um, you know, as, as there was so much going on in the world in terms of women's rights, you know, it was that the Me Too move, movement, um, the Kavanaugh trials were were being blared everywhere. You know, then you had sort of Johnny Depp and the Amber Heard and you know, another case of, you know, trauma being sort of showcased and fetishized for profit in many ways. Um, you know, and, and it's just, uh, it was very interesting to me, the parallels as, as I, as I wrote, sort of kept thinking, well, this, this is crazy. It just doesn't seem like, I mean, m much has changed for the better, but some of the things that haven't changed are, are very, um, disturbing and thought provoking. And, and I know you mentioned that, you know, hysteria was in the DSM up until 1980. I, I will point out that it was resurrected by Def Leppard in 1987 as the title of, uh, <laughs> A very popular <laughs> album. Um, it's it's the word itself is still in pretty regular rotation. I have to say, I mean, it gets flung at me, <laughs> you know, by by you know from time to time as well. I think it's it's a word um, that still has a lot of intrigue, you know, and and interest, and um, you know, sort of is is still used to try to kind of impose a definition on things that otherwise we we have a really hard time defining. Yeah, so it's not surprising. <laughs> Well, Jennifer, um, I always like to get to know my guests a little bit more through pop culture. So I'm curious, uh, when you were growing up, uh, maybe it was back when you were in Mr. Cohane's class, what were some of your favorite things to uh, watch on TV? Uh, we, we had very limited TV options in our household, which was probably in part why I'm a writer. I had to read. That was where I got my entertainment. Um when I could, I would sneak over to friends' houses and I would watch things like the monkeys and the banana splits. Those were like, you know, sure. forbidden pleasures to us. <laughs> uh, Partridge Family was another one. Brady Bunch. You know, we did household, you know, Mutual of uh, Wild Kingdom was the permitted viewing that we would sort of do as a family on Sunday nights. Um, and uh, so those were, I think those were some of the shows and you know, things like Zoom, you know, anything on PBS was basically a free pass. So we watched a lot of Zoom and Electric Company. Oh, wow. Oh, man. But the monkeys, I remember. I'm old, in other words. <laughs> well, no, no. Yes. Yeah, so, well, um, you know, we're uh, we're in the same vein, I think. Um, but I, man, I used to love, you know, it's so silly. I used to love the monkeys. I mean, just. Oh, they were great. Yeah, they were just, they were so, there was something incredibly energizing about that show. Um, and, and the music was actually. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the music. I mean, there's actually a song on my playlist now by the Monkees. You know, um, which I had, yeah, Mag me and Magdalena, mm. um, which is one of their very recent pieces. But it's quite, it's a beautiful ballad. You know, um, when I sort of first heard it, I looked it up. I was singing this, just, and it was the Monkees. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they continue have to have some modern cultural relevance, clearly. Well, you kind of led right into my next question, which is, what did you like to listen to growing up? Um, let's see. I like when I sort of got my first stereo, which I saved up for and you know bought myself. I think my very first album was "Who's Next," The Who. Um, Great album. I still listen to a lot of songs from that. You know, very powerful, beautiful layered music. Um, I also loved you know Elvis Costello very early on. He was like one of my favorites. David Bowie. Uh, still, still love both of them. Um, trying to think, I sort of once I got to college, I got very into sort of um, new wave. So I was listening to a lot of Cure and um, you know, um, Violent Femmes and and you know, classic sort of nineteen eighties new wave stuff. Oh yeah, uh, all that, all that is great. I but but you know, you mentioned Who's Next, which I think is such a, a seminal album. Um, but and the cover was great. The, oh, the cover was. <laughs> My was mother epic. was always just when I brought it home. She's like, "What is this?" Uh, it's, yeah, it's a great cover. Really, you know, really one for epic. the one for the ages. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, there's so many good songs on that album. I have, I'd say, my favorite. The song is over. Um, just oh, yeah. great. Yeah, the last last track on side one. Um, it's for for. I mean, we say side one. It's not really relevant anymore for for many right. people. Don't listen to to tapes or um, 
or, or records. Well, it's it's making a comeback. People are, are are really interested in vinyl again. You know, I mean, that's been really heartening to see. Um, that you know, st- record stores are opening up. Records are being you know minted again for for you know a sort of smaller, more more um, selective indie audience. Um, so you know, I think I think we can still still throw the term around. All right, very good. And Jennifer, if you can go back in time, I always like to call this my uh, my dear younger me question. Um, and maybe mm-hmm. it's again, I, I hate to 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 bring him his name up for the third time, but but your sixth grade teacher, um, <laughs> poor Mister King, and I definitely okay. have to write him now. Yeah, <laughs> but if you if you can go back in time and whisper some words of advice into that Jennifer's ear, what would you tell the younger Jennifer? Um, boy, that's that's a tough one, isn't it? I think I would tell myself to um, have faith. You know, I think that's the big the big thing about writing is that it's really kind of an act of of faith. You know, it's like leaping off of a cliff and just hoping you don't you fly and don't crashed to the ground you know um but unless you're able to actually do that you really can't you can't write you know that's the first step so i think just affirming that you know it's okay to want to do something that seems um ex- exceptional and maybe even impossible um give yourself the right to write you know and give yourself the right to write badly sometimes uh you know it, because if you don't write badly you're not going to write well you know they're kind of they're kind of interconnected Um, so I would say that's, you know, that's probably what I would say. Just, just have faith that this is something you can do and that you should do and keep doing it even when it feels like you can't do it. All right. And turn to friends, you know, turn to community because it helps to loop. Community as we we discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, Jennifer, um, I'm sure there's some people listening who are thinking to themselves, how can I get in touch with Jennifer Cody Epstein? So Jennifer, do you have a website or social media handles you want to share with everybody? Um, I do have a website and my social media handles are on it. The website is um, jennifercodyepstein.com. Not very um, sort of original, but direct. So if you go to that, you'll get to me. Um, I also, I was off Facebook for a while, but I just went back on. So I think I'm at Jennifer Epstein there. Jen Cody Epstein on Twitter for now. Uh, although I don't know how long Twitter is going to be a thing. Um, and I think I'm Jen Cody Epstein on Instagram and threads too. So those okay. are all places you can look for me. I will be sure to include all of that in the show notes so people can just uh, tap on their devices and uh, get to you that way. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for stopping by Uncorking a Story and letting me uncork yours. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.